have identified some very, very interesting anomalous um, type of aircraft. The traffic is quite luminous and is exhibiting some anomalistic motion of it. Uh, moved very rapidly at any speed or whether any direction it wanted to go. Why it could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. EWA-517, do you want to report a UFO? Over. Negative. We don't want to report. One of my worst Wednesday night. Good evening, everybody. This is Smiles Lewis and... Hey, everybody. Mark Jackson here. Thank you all for joining us for this May 3rd, Wednesday, 2023, live edition of Anomaly Now, uh, straight out of Austin, Texas, on behalf of the 501c3 nonprofit, the Scientific Anomaly Institute, a.k.a. Anomaly Archives. So good to be with you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mark. Uh, hey, yeah, I loved uh, all the... The uh, Bigfoot Sasquatch uh, stuff you're sporting. Yeah. I've had that hat before, and uh, I love it. I love that hat. Yeah. And uh, I'm uh, repping a little thinker thunker for everybody out there. Um, if you do have a passion for cryptids and your favorite one happens to be the hide-and-seek champion of the world, then uh, go find yourself some thinker thunker on YouTube or his website, and um, you might be surprised at what you find in there. It's good stuff. Yeah, he uh, gives real uh, down-to-earth uh, examination of like the latest interesting um, uh, sighting videos, and um, just really appreciate his analysis. Yeah, he's linked up recently and gone out with the Rocky Mountain Sasquatch organization. A couple of them, the 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 enthusiasts have sort of tightened their group, and they're doing a lot more in field stuff. It's very interesting. Um, not sure that they really want to run into one of these fellas or gals as uh, the Patterson film ended up, you know, coming to fruition in, in terms of it being female. But anyway, I digress into my favorite subject. Let's kick it off here, Miles. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I did want to, uh, of course, direct folks to, uh, they can go check out more about uh, the Anomaly Archives over at our website. That's anomalyarchives.org. And you can link through to the uh, archives of the uh, this very show, Anomaly Now. Uh, that's where we put the links to all the YouTube archived vodcast versions. Of course, we make an audio version of this that goes out through all the podcast channels. But uh, some of those, uh, the older ones kind of fall off uh, after time. We're going on the cheap <laughs> for uh, archive space for the audio. But the video is it there and will be for as long as we don't get canceled by YouTube. So, um Meanwhile, uh, you folks can follow along with the news links that we cover, that we aggregate over at our Flipboard. That's flipboard.com slash at Anomaly Archives. And uh, the link there will take you to uh, where we post all these thousands of li links. Uh, I think we have, it says we have over 9,600 stories and over almost 20,000 page flips. I, I, I definitely believe the stories part, the page flips, I'm not sure what that means exactly, but I think that's, this folks, and I will say I was on there earlier today, um, Smiles, and I got to say, every single time I follow that link, I'm so impressed with the depth and width um, of the stories that you're posting and accumulating, aggregating here for the layperson. And I got to say, anybody listening, if you want to, you know, roll up your sleeves for even 30 minutes or something and just, you know, scroll through all this stuff you're going to yeah. find something that's going to pique your interest there's enough Absolutely. there so uh, just well done and, and it's such a great effort and resource to everybody uh, of like-mindedness etc yeah so i try to aggregate these into just uh succinct news links for the, the email newsletter 
And uh, yeah, I get lots of feedback from that from folks who are just like, Where, how do you find all these articles? And yeah, how, how do you Wait a minute. Them how do you find them all? Um, uh, you know, <laughs> just the, the usual uh, social media sites, other people sharing links um, and just uh, what comes across my feed uh, or my great. feeds. And um, yeah, it's, there's too many to, to, all, to read all of them. That's the thing. You have to kind of be discerning and, and take the time to look at stuff there's all kinds of stuff we never get to to all the different stuff but i um, see romans from oh. outer space <laughs> that's exactly my point folks if that's your thing find it in flipboard right here follow the link if you're in the yeah. space, romans from outer space that's an article uh i believe by uh is it scott corrales uh writing for ap magazine.info that's the uh, alternate perceptions brent rains is uh, magazine that uh, also Dr. Greg Little, I believe, is, is, is associated with uh, Greg and, and Brent being longtime friends. Um, yeah, so much great stuff. Uh, I just earlier uh, this evening was uh, watching the webinar. Uh, there's been, as we've been mentioning, upcoming part two, the, the second annual uh, in Archives of the Impossible conference uh, in, at, in Houston at Rice University. Last year's was uh, launching their new archive there in Houston, a fantastic conference, videos of which are all online. And uh, this, uh, just like last year, they have a lead-in where they do weekly pre-conference webinars uh, where they have discussions or lectures by various people. And uh, I have I had was not able to watch these uh, two previous ones by Gustavo Rodriguez Roca or uh, Yvonne Chirot. But, uh, of course, I had to tune in uh, today for good friend Joshua Cutchins' uh, discussion with uh, Dr. Jeff Kripal. And uh, always interesting to hear uh, two people that you respect and who I think have great uh, uh, wisdom to impart on these subjects talk together and, and have a discussion. So that was great. They'll, I'm sure they'll be posting these to their uh, YouTube channel soon. Um, but there is, of course, this whole conference coming up. And it is a hybrid conference, so folks can go. Uh, to impossiblearchive.rice.edu slash, well, it's more, I think, uh, maybe uh, that'll link through, but uh, all kinds of great people uh, scheduled to, to uh, um, give lectures and panel discussions at this this year's events, which come up uh, Thursday, May 11th through Saturday, May 13th. And it's completely free. <clears throat> you can go in person or you can uh, watch through uh, your their Zoom uh, set up. So that's pretty cool. I'm, I'm really glad that that's, that's going forward. Um, I wanted to continue our discussion or just at least give a, a, uh, some follow up to last week's, uh, story where we were talking about, uh, the, well, actually, uh, we, we talked about the suspicious cattle deaths reported in uh, South central, Southeastern central, uh, Texas, across three counties, six different animals, uh, across multiple herds, multiple pastures, along the uh, OSR, Old San Antonio Road, a uh, highly trafficked area. Um, I have not heard of any new details coming out of uh, law enforcement there. Uh, however, it has unsurprisingly created quite a buzz, and a lot of folks are like us talking about it, trying to report on it, trying to see what other information we can find. Um, I did want to comment that I did recently uh, listen to the latest episode of uh, the Dark Outdoors podcast, which, which is done by a good friend, another Bigfoot uh, outdoorsman, Chester Moore. Um, he has a nonprofit called Higher Calling that's at highercalling.net. And uh, um, he's an outdoorsman writer. He's the editor-in-chief of Texas Fish and Game. Yeah. And he's an outdoors journalist for over 19 years. And uh, I first became aware of his interest in cryptozoology in, I believe, 2002 or 2003, when I first met him in 2003. Um, anyway, he's got his uh, the latest episode of his season two of, of Dark Outdoors podcast, which is, of course, about the mutilations. And he has a guest on and they talk about this. They've previously reported on the Texas horse ripping cases, a horrific case of, of animals being mutilated, tortured. Uh, in, uh, but in that case, horses, but, uh, very interesting stuff. Um, nothing particularly new, but again, these are two that he and his guest are people who, uh, are much more experienced when it comes to the outdoors and, uh, dealing with, uh, the processing 
of of animals that they've uh, hunted um and he reports on on their take on this and i will say they do tend they, they are leaning towards the that this is some kind of human activity that it's pretty that it's nefarious in the sense that it, it may be some kind of uh, cult or serial killings, and I don't, I do not lean towards that at all. But um, I do uh, find their perspective and, and input potentially valuable, and I just wanted to comment on that. Um, you know, we commented last week about how, in looking into this, and after ha- me having heard a- about uh, it being reported on NPR or rather KUT locally, uh, how we discovered about this this eighteen to twenty thousand cattle that died in this terrible uh, explosion. Well, researching this, I came across um, this uh, podcast or rather this uh, vodcast video at Yanasa TV, which I was not familiar with. Um, uh, But this gentleman uh, who hosts it does a nice uh, 17 minute video on various uh, mysteries going on. Um, he, he talks about all the different things that we've been talking about, the, the, the various cattle deaths in Oregon and in Colorado. Um, um, and he made me aware of a couple of different things, not least of which is uh, this case uh, out of Colorado, or actually, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure which uh, state this is in, but a major undertaking, quote unquote, authorities say it's not easy to steal 80 head of cattle that didn't stop someone in Baca County. Uh, this was back in January and I bring this up just because that's what the main part of that other video by uh, the Yanas TV uh, host is uh, mainly reporting on at the beginning of it, but he goes into a lot of different other cases. But um, this is another case where, I mean, okay, I, I'm not a rancher, I'm not a farmer, I'm not really interested in the cattle industry, but um, this this gentleman had 80 head of cattle, and I, I think I've seen another article claim that they were all pregnant. Um, but, uh, this is, un- this is apparently highly unusual for that many cattle to just vanish and there to be apparently no leads, or at least none are being reported in the mainstream media that I was seeing, but, uh, it's just a strange case and it's probably just cattle rustling, but it was one of the weird places that this led. Um, but going back to, uh, this video with, uh, this gentleman on Yanasa TV, this Michigan farmer, fine scrap metal, aluminum tied to corn stalks in three fields. At the end of this video, the 17-minute video, the, the host goes into the fact that uh, he basically s- asserts that he would not be surprised if if many of these have to do with uh, environmental extremists, uh, as he describes them, who will do everything to try to literally kill the cattle industry, even involving killing the cattle. And the idea in this article that I have not had the chance to follow up uh, researching is that... Um, and I think he said that he was he was actually personally aware of this this case where um, this Michigan farmer the, the assertion is that th- this aluminum was left by such uh, extremist activists as a way of introducing metal fragments into the cornmeal that then would be ingested by the the cattle and kill the cattle as a way of trying to thwart the cattle industry who where who so many. Uh, environmentalists assert is, is is the root of all evil and and the cause for uh, global climate change uh, through the through the cattle industry. Not uh, commenting on that, I just found it interesting. I never even heard of that kind of level. Of course, you hear of uh, environmentalists uh, who are against deforestation, doing things like putting sp- metal spikes into to trees so that when they get cut down, it'll jam up the chainsaws of of uh, the loggers and that sort of thing. So it's, you know, not out of the realm of possibility, but um, that, that maybe this is some kind of um, activity going on uh, by the type of a group. Just briefly switching back to um, Chester Moore's podcast, they, t- they are still, as I said, leaning towards a human culprit and um, suspecting that there's some kind of copycat dark web group that are imitating uh, are trying to emulate quote unquote the classic uh, cattle mutilation phenomena on their own as, as a way of thrill seeking and and getting notoriety not so much uh, for them having personally done it but just seeing the rush of seeing uh, this in the news and the media um, I I'm not sure I, I buy into that but um, I still find it interesting and then just this one last bit uh, you know we were saying how well, you know, 
if this is the true quote unquote UFO uh, cattle mutilation phenomenon, then where's the UFOs? Um, and I, I think this mm. here, but um, yeah, I, I uh, found through a viewer uh, this uh, I am the American YouTube channel. I'm not familiar with this guy, but he's, I believe, a single Texan, and he did uh, his own investigation report on this. Very in, uh, 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 how you say, hobby-oriented, but he has on the phone somebody who claims to have seen a UFO associated with this, though I, it seems unclear the details of it, so I, I'm a little uh, skeptical. But just for uh, everybody out there... Ask her to tell me that again. Tell, tell me that story one more time. Like, she said it fast. I just said, yeah. Okay, we were outside. It was just dark to kind of get dark, but enough for us to kind of see up the sky. Um, I was like, "What is that?" And I looked up. I was like, "Where did point it?" I was like, "There's no lights on that." I was like, "What is that?" He said, "I don't know, but it's moving pretty fast, and there was no lights." It was shaped like a cigar, but it was moving pretty fast. And Charles says, "That ain't no plane." Now, for Charles to say something, you know how he is. <laughs> for Charles to say stuff, he's like, "I don't know what that is," but he said, "That ain't no plane." I was like, "Honey, oh, he's like, well, no." He was kind of hesitant about it, but. I'll tell you the exact same thing. It was weird. <laughs> right, Mo. So, so I'll say that, you know, I listened to that pretty much the, the full episode that he had. Um, one thing that, you know, jumps out at me that he ends up, and folks, by the way, if you want to watch that, the link is great. And uh, one thing growing up rural in a ranching community, just like he is, um, oil field slash, uh, you know, uh, ranching communities, he brings up the fact that, the, that, Contrary to popular belief of city folk, for example, these rural roads aren't that rural. Um, particularly when you have cattle and you have land, um, these landmen, uh, they monitor their land because that's all they do, frankly. It's their living, and they're always driving around. I remember growing up and, uh, you know, guys saying, oh, got to leave, I'm going to do, you know, do their lap or whatever, and they go monitor their land. They're all they're their own game and fish department. They're, you know... It's what they do. And so the notion that some of this stuff, particularly the frequency and volume of cases that they had here in Texas, where it was five miles apart, you know, it, from county to county, kind of this leapfrog sort of phenomena or whatever, the fact that nobody saw something is strange because I know that the culture, that culture is, you know, you monitor your own land because that's your, that's your livelihood. So anyway, he goes on, he explains a little bit about that. And that's where he made these phone calls and what we just listened to came from. And that is sure enough, somebody did listen to it. Uh, or I'm sorry, somebody did see something as he indicated in the header in the video here. So, I mean, that that's that was interesting to me because it's true. It's These aren't rural roads. There are people constantly trying to find something to do. And then also because their livelihood is tied to it, they're all, they're monitoring this all the time. Yeah. That these, these are not out in, you know, middle of nowhere, so to speak, sticks. I mean, those these things are being tended, fences, et cetera. Anyway, I just thought th I'd throw that out there from personal experience. So, Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll have the link to this and the other uh, links that we've uh, mentioned and shown. Uh, to switching gears, um, so, ah. Uh, well, so we, of course, have previously talked about the Trinity case, uh, as written about by my favorite UFO researcher, uh, Jacques Vallée, and a co-researched piggybacking off of the work of Paolo Harris. Well, um, Douglas Dean Johnson, uh, who often uh, is highly critical of what he thinks of as bunk, has done a uh, alleged three month investigation into this particular case. And I got to say, um, I think he appears to have done a really good job of doing all the kind of basic preliminary due diligence stuff that one would have assumed I did and hoped I did. Uh, 
Jacques Vallée and uh, Paulo Harris had done. Uh, as much as there was uh, in this case that uh, caused me, you know, to be skeptical as with anything, the the fact that uh, you know Jacques Vallée is an authority figure that I look up to and respect makes me just kind of put aside like, oh, of course he's done the, this due diligence and. Um, and there's definitely aspects of this case that I'm just like, well, that's interesting. We can't verify it. But the thing I was, were, I got a little upset about at the beginning was how many people seem to be dismissing it without, you know, pointing out certain things like the, the alleged military witness, uh, that is uh, referenced in, in the book as having, I believe seen the crash site from the air. Uh, who thus seemed to be a corroborating witness, seemed unrelated to the two primary witnesses, only one of whom is still alive. And um, I kept thinking, well, somebody's got to be investigating that. And in my own investigation of that person's name, which I believe is spelled completely incorrectly in two different ways in the book, and as I was researching uh, other things about it, um, I forget the the name, is something like Brophy or... Um, Blofy or something, but uh, that person uh, is alleged in this investigation to be uh, a serial liar <laughs> uh, who may be had been piggybacking off the reputation of their uh, military pilot father. I believe I haven't gotten to that part, but this uh, this investigation, uh, this crash debris UFO crash hoax. Trinity UFO hoax by Douglas Dean Johnson over at douglasjohnson.ghost.io goes into a number of different articles. Uh, there's this hub article that is just a couple pages long, but has the links to, I guess it's a dozen or so uh, individual uh, investigative bullet points. I've only really had the chance to read the one, and that is this one about Eddie Apodaca, the real policeman who cracked the Trinity UFO crash case. And I gotta say, uh, wow, uh, this uh, this this pretty much to me is a smoking gun. That uh, it it really does appear that these uh, two individuals who were claim making this claim of the of the crashed UFO are either completely misremembering and attributing uh, reality to one person that may be some person that has yet to actually be identified. But the likelier explanation is that they just made it up. Um, that involves the the use of this uh, state trooper, Eddie Apodaca, uh, who was actually a pretty interesting character unto himself. Uh, he was one of the uh, very few original New Mexico State Police officers, um, and the uh, uh, Douglas Jean, excuse me, uh, Douglas Dean Johnson uh, goes into uh, the history of this fellow, and they he was able to corroborate this person's identity and history, and it really boils down to the fact that this um, this officer was an enlisted man in the military and didn't return to the United States until three months after the alleged event occurred when he's alleged to have uh, interacted with the, the kids and the, their father or one of the kids' father. And that's that's pretty uh, damning, isn't it? Uh, yeah, but, you know, I, I have a tough time with this as I will just say off the top, this whole case has been taken out as a tainted data set. You know, as a scientist, this is just like, you know, not viable, you know, so I'm taking it out of uh, my consideration, et cetera. I'm not judging it one way or the other. It's just being taken off the table, so to speak. So I'll look at the, the rest of the evidence. In fact, you have a link to other shows tonight, um, Smiles, where we have whistleblowers coming forward for the current congressional hearings, et cetera. Um, in some of that, which is a much stronger case from what I've read, at least from this. So I'll, we'll just remove this. Now, these people are uneducated. Do they get the names wrong? I don't know. I haven't looked enough into it. Um, is there monetary, uh, you know, I mean, just because somebody's going after money 
doesn't mean things also didn't happen. Both things can be true. Yes. And there could be these wild spun stories around this stuff. I don't, I don't know. I, I, again, I, it's so complicated at this point after reading this article today. But by the way, folks, that is another reason to follow up with Smiles' research and what he's offering on, on the subjects we talk on every week because you're going to get a balanced approach to this stuff. So by putting this out there, you can make up your own mind. So I'm... I'm just look. I, it's too complicated for me to try to make a judgment, so to speak. So I'm just like I said, I'm taking it off the table. Yeah, um, there, there's there's a lot of moving parts to this, but uh, it, it is interesting. Just in the one article, that one, that one uh, bit about Eddie uh, uh, Apodaca, um, there's a number of data points as far as how far back uh, the the two alleged witnesses had been trying to. Uh, get attention drawn to this case. And um, I think I had mentioned in our previous coverage of this that Kevin Randall says he thinks that he and Don Schmidt were contacted by email back in 96, 1996, 1997 by these uh, alleged witnesses. And this came up during an interview that he was doing with Rob Swiatek, who's in that same interview said that he thought he'd gotten emails forwarded from Don Berliner that went to all the fun for UFO research people back in 2000, 2003. Well, this article related how uh, Jose Padilla had been on the Jeff Renz program back in November of 2003. Uh, and then in uh, 2005, the uh, uh, other uh, alleged witness, Remy Baca, had created a paper uh, in March of 2005 that he had provided to Ryan S. Wood in advance of a November 2005 UFO crash retrieval conference. Um also, going back to that Kevin Randall Swiatek interview, Kevin had said that he thought that he had then again, Kevin had uh, gotten, uh, that, that he and Stan Friedman had gotten emails again from the, the, from the witnesses back in 2010 when they were again, uh, seven years later or, or however many years later, trying to uh, get interest in this. And then uh, the article mentions that there were uh, several other interviews done in 2010 uh, Jose Padilla got a radio interview with host Richard Surrett in December of 2010. And also in December of that year, Jose Padilla also was interviewed by Mel Fabregas on the uh, Veritas radio show um, and on and on and on. And of course, it was in 2016 when uh, I and members of the Roswell Slides Research Group were approached by a uh, lead move on investigator who I will not name, but uh, this person was coming to us because they were so concerned about their own investigation for MUFON uh, into this case, showing that it seemed like it was a fraud. And yet Jan Harzen was uh, treating Paolo as a, you know, top guest. And she was the lead uh, presenter in that year's conference, and they gave her the cover article on one of the MUFON journals about this case. And so this was one of the, the things that was causing great concern amongst people in MUFON was this uh, focus on what many believe just right out the gate that this was a, a, a false case. So, uh, But it's a very detailed uh, article that folks can ch check out over at the douglasjohnson.goes.io will have the link to that as I say uh, yeah but we'll let people draw their own conclusions but yes um, Miles you know, when did this article come out uh, just a, a couple of days ago okay so basically, basically Jacques hasn't Valet hasn't had a chance to respond to this right I mean he, so I'm going to keep my ear out to see if yeah. there's any formal from his camp to see if there's any um response i'm not expecting it but it'd be interesting if there was if there was refuting you know evidence etc yeah they're they're yeah he hasn't he he was uh he was attempted to be interviewed by uh the author um as reported on that very hub page uh but yeah so i don't think there's been any official response yet it would really be nice to see some kind of response because it, it is yeah. distressing um uh, to to see ha, have see this happen, and it's it you, you mentioned uh, the connection to the whistleblower stuff. This is what's really wild. Um, is you know we reported how um, uh, just a few months ago, um, uh, let's see, 
let's see, yeah, dailystar.co.uk headline, Biden orders investigation into UFO piloted by many aliens with big bulgy eyes. And this was all a reference to the Trinity case. And then uh, they also reported exclusive Pentagon ordered reinvestigate ordered to reinvestigate 1945 crash of mysterious avocado shaped UFO dubbed the Roswell before Roswell as experts reveal eyewitness accounts of the encounter. Uh, and the New York Times reported, did aliens land on Earth in 1945? A defense bill seeks answers reporting on exactly uh, what you're le- alluding to this this revision allegedly of the uh, the, the, the bill about the UAP stuff. Um, being revised to, from going as far back as 1947 with the Roswell case to 1945, presumably because of this uh, alleged case. Um, and and lo and behold, what do we have now? We have the DailyMail.com again, uh, claiming uh, just uh, last month, six whistleblowers who claim they worked on military UFO programs, retrieving and analyzing crash material have come forward, blah, 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 blah. And it's the usual suspects, uh, Daniel Sheehan and uh, I think Gary Nolan and um, uh, several other high profile uh, people in the, the UFO field, Lou Elizondo, of course. Uh, Eric Davis, Hell Put Off, the usual. Um, uh, alleging that they each, you know, have contact with um, uh, whistleblowers. And of course, uh, here we have uh, Aero Director Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick may have hinted that his office has indeed interviewed whistleblowers in testimony to Senator Kirsten Gillibrand at a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing on Wednesday. And uh, this show called The Good Trouble Show, it's, I believe, a YouTube-oriented streaming show, uh, got a nice little interview with uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. And here she alludes to uh, the, is asked about the whistleblowing aspect. Some of the feedback that we've received in, in particular from um, whistleblowers that have worked on alleged legacy UAP pro, uh, programs, but they're hesitant to come forward is is what they've shared is that there's no published uh, legal protection mechanisms uh, that are give them the legal assurance that, that they are indeed going to be covered. So they can reach out to your office and yep. uh, and and you can download or, or or make it clear exactly what what protections are in place. Yep, they can definitely do that, and they can. Um, we have an email that is confidential, just casework at jillabrand.senate.gov, and if they just put UAP in the ray line, it'll get to our our military staff, who will then follow up and make sure that they are um, given confidential uh, support and advice on what what their next steps could be and, and where the protections lie. Excellent. Okay, great. So uh, if you have time, we just have a, another couple of... Yeah. So there's... Uh, yeah, I, I just to go back to the, the Trinity case and all the press that it got and, you know, the involvement of Valet, um, the, the author of that expose... Uh, you know, comments about Valet's age, and you know, I know others and myself have been wondering how how did he come to be sucked into this? Yeah, uh, he says in the book about a, a friend of his who was unfortunately died in a terrible car wreck or some uh, accident, um, had brought it to his attention, and that that's kind of how it all started. And that, and then at some point he he discovered that the Paolo had had been doing this research for many years, and so he just got with her. Um, and you know, I can take all that as probable just happens. And, and then it just becomes kind of this, well, is, has he lost his edge? Was he ever as good of an investigative researcher? And I'm not here to trash fully. I, you know, I, this is, it's forgivable. Uh, it's just unfortunate, but there's that part of me that still, you know, Valet is one of those people who's often been associated with the the, the, the aviary and this idea of uh, all these different uh, government uh, military intelligence insiders who have been, you know, on their own uh, looking into the UFO phenomena and possibly working for larger forces to uh, help prepare the public, you know, for the inevitable revelation of the core story of, of, of crash saucers and pickled aliens even though Valet has 
really largely been the person kind of pushing back against that narrative um, while acknowledging that that narrative just keeps coming up over and over and over again. So it just, there's that part of me that's like paranoid, like it almost seems like it was some kind of an op, like somehow this was seeded into all this current uh, upsurge in, in UAP uh, disclosure um, uh, and it just muddies the water. How did it make it that far into the government inquiries? You know, you would think somebody would have a team vetting some of this stuff if they were going to bring this up, um, you know, on, in an official or reportable basis or whatnot. So I got to believe that this journalist, th that other people were running this same stuff down. Maybe not. You know, you give your government too much credit, et cetera. But um, this case made its way to the very top. And um, you have to ask yourself, does that mean something? Yeah. What does that mean also? So there's yeah. questions within questions on this one at Pandora's box for sure. <laughs> for sure. Well, uh, there's all kinds of amazing other news uh, that I would encourage folks to go to the Flipboard to look at uh, that we're not going to get to cover tonight. Um, there's this uh, aerial drone surveillance harassment case uh, up uh, I forget which state it is, but um, uh, Coast to Coast AM, I think Tim Banal wrote up a little article, video, nightly visits by mysterious drones leaving Mar Maryland family looking for answers, April 28, 2023, which uh, hinges on a local investigation from WUSA9.com, uh, where they went out to this, this couple's house and did their own recording and saw what probably was drones, they, but they also saw... Uh, a, a low flying, what they presume to be a commercial flight, uh, go by. And then it came by again. And when they did the, uh, you know, F, the FAA tracking data, they discovered that it was a, a Navy plane that had been circling the area. And that sure enough, the Navy says, oh, we're doing some kind of secret surveillance out there. Don't worry, but there's going to be noise at night. Sorry. Um, so that's kind of interesting, and apparently there's speculation that that particular type of aircraft can launch drones, but um, interesting little case there that is a rabbit hole, but that gets into the uh, issue of drones and how uh, <laughs> how they're changing our lives and, uh, in some cases, uh, driving some families crazy. Um, and some amazing science and tech news. Um, actually, I should... Oh, uh, yeah, I got to bring this one up here before we close out tonight. Um I'll probably go ahead and, and, um, oh, did I, yeah, hold on folks. Well, anyway, this, uh, this headline from CBS Austin.com, uh, UT creates device that reads minds, turns thoughts into text. Wow. Um, you know, anybody who's been following me, uh, for all these many years knows that one of my, the earliest things I talked about was my interest in a dream recorder. This, uh, this idea of somehow being able to take all the data inside people's heads, uh, and, well, during their nightly dream time sojourns and, um, translate it into either a recording or a visualization that could be played back. Well, this isn't that, but my gosh, um, they've apparently been able now to uh, reconstruct words from people's thoughts. And it seems like it's a fairly simple approach. I, I, I'm not sure if that's a uh, what type of um, device that is, uh, but basically uh, that this uh, biomedical imaging center at the University of Texas, uh, they they would play um, audio, they would pay play audio of storytelling to these people and re and monitor their brain activity. So they know like what the brain activity looks like when it hears these certain words. And then they would have the person go back in and uh, think of that story in their head and see the sim see similar uh, brain activity and then turning this into uh, a way of, uh, of using algorithms to decode that signal and come up with words and um you know let me see if i can get a little bit of this here um 
other AI technology that says non-surgical and non-invasive. Researchers say it works, but it's hard to really call it accurate because it doesn't turn thoughts into text word for word. One example that, that we often use is um, uh, the actual story said, uh, uh, I didn't even have my driver's license yet. The decoded version was she hadn't even learned to drive yet. Researchers say they were surprised the decoder still worked even when the participants weren't hearing spoken language. Even when somebody is seeing a movie, you can kind of, the model can kind of predict uh, word descriptions of what they're seeing. Some might be leery when it comes to mental privacy, though. Yep, they would be. <laughs> yeah, this says in the conspiracy theorist to me is just like wants to scream right now. This is DARPA <laughs> written all over it, where the point is where this was already developed you know, and then like somebody was like, okay, UT, you can have this, you can nibble on our, you know, uh, on our results or whatever, and you can go develop this in the public sphere or whatnot. Um, I will say after kind of delving into that smiles is that, you know, these people had to sit in these MRIs for 16 hours and they listened to the same story over and over and over again while their, their brain scans were monitored. So I mean, as far as where UT's at on the technology, it's really far out. I mean, in terms of any sort of applicable, you know, application, um, relevant application anyway. But to me, this screams like this was already developed somewhere and it was sort of ferried into the, you know, the academic sphere. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Careful at the grocery store. Yeah. Well, as one of our uh, viewers uh, just commented, this sounds horrible. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds terrible. <laughs> it could, but it could, it could have good tech uh, applications. No, but not outweighing the bad on this one. This it's, is it's worrisome. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate you tuning in now or listening later. You can go to anomalyarchives.org and you can check out all our past episodes and uh, tune in to, to live next week. We'll see you very, very soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mike. All right.